In this lesson, we're going to take a look at a few different processes that change the internal energy of a system. So we're going to be looking at applying the first law. Now remember, the first law of thermodynamics is the change in internal energy is equal to the heat added to the system minus the work done by the system. And so what we want to do is see if we can find a way to relate heat and work to pressure, volume, and temperature, since those are our three state variables, and we're all, all oftentimes analyzing thermodynamic processes by looking at pressure versus volume curves. So let's get started by looking at an isobaric process. Now, iso means same, and baric refers to pressure. So an isobaric process is one that occurs at a constant pressure, or the pressure is unchanging. Now, before we get too far into this, I want to take a look at a pressure versus volume graph that you guys actually made in lab one day. And it was back when we were studying the law of conservation or sorry, no, it was back when we were studying um, the ideal gas law. And you took a syringe and put some air in it, and then you increased the volume of the syringe, and as you did, you saw that the pressure went lower, 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 lower. Well, you did this slowly, which means that this temperature was always the same as room temperature, which means you never had a change in temperature. So here, at this temperature, you had pressure and volume. So this is called an isotherm. This curve is called an isotherm because it happens at a constant temperature. If that temperature in the room had been warmer, you could have done the exact same experiment, only your curve would have been displaced a little bit further right because at a higher temperature, a given volume will have a higher pressure. So T1 and T2, we know that T1 is less than T2, or that T2 is a higher temperature. Now, all of that is just to set us up for this. Okay, where we have a pressure versus volume curve, and we have our first state, which occurs at this volume and pressure, and we have our second state over here, which occurs at the same pressure, but different volume. Now, what we want to understand is how something could move from state one to state two, and yet the pressure remains constant, because I could connect up some isotherms that would go through here, like this one's over here, and this one's over here, and that gives us a clue about this because this is shifted further right. We know this must happen at a higher temperature. So how do I get a higher temperature without getting a higher pressure? Well, that's given down here because our volume is also greater. But remember, I'm trying to relate all this back to actually the first law, which says the change in internal energy is equal to the heat added minus the work done. So in this particular instance, is there anything I can get off of this graph that was related to the heat added or to the work done? And the answer is yes, but it might not be a immediately apparent. So I'm going to focus in on this term. How much work must have been done? And how do I know work must have been done? Well, I know that the volume had to get bigger. In order to keep the pressure the same, the volume had to get bigger. And the way a volume gets bigger is the air in the system does work, or the gas in the system does work, by expanding. So if it was initially occupying this volume, then this piston might have moved up, and now it occupies this volume. Well, how much work was done? This is actually not super complicated. What we know is work is equal to force times displacement. That's way back from physics one. Well, we know that if the piston was originally here and it got moved to here, then the force acting moved through this distance. So there's our delta x. But the gas exerts a pressure, and force is harder to measure. But we do know that pressure is equal to force over area. So really what we know is force is equal to pressure times area. So I'm just going to go ahead and make these substitutions down here. So instead of force, I'm going to take the pressure of the gas times the area, and this happens to be the area of this piston, right? Because that's the, that's the area that the gas is pushing on. And then the delta x is that change in, in position from here to here. But if you think about that, what we just did was we measured the area of this piston and we multiplied it by this height, which gives us the volume of this new area, or this new space right here, which means the change in volume times the pressure actually tells us how much work was done, which geometrically, if we look on this graph, is actually just this area of this rectangle right here, because down here we had V1, here's V2, so our change in volume is from V1 to V2, which is this length, and our pressure is along this isobar, this, this line, this horizontal line that represents a constant pressure, and so the area of this rectangle equals work done. So that's pretty cool, which means we can actually rewrite law of conservation of energy, change in internal energy is equal to the heat added to the system minus the work done by the system, but that work done is equal to the pressure times the change in volume. So it's, an, it's another representation of the first law, but this allows us to talk about it in terms of pressure and volume and heat rather than just work.
Now we derived that the area under this pressure versus volume curve was equal to the work done for this nice constant isobar at a constant pressure, but it's true regardless of the shape. So the area under a pressure versus volume curve is always equal to the work done by the system. This next process we're going to do is called an isochoric, um, which is also called isometric, as in volumetric, which means we're dealing with a constant volume. And because the volume is constant, if we look at a pressure versus volume graph, this is going to be a vertical line. So we have state 1, which is here, and we have state 2, which is here, and this is straight up. Now if you think about what that means, that means since we know the area under the curve is equal to the work, there is no work because there is no area. The work is equal to zero. No work is done by or on the system. So, well, how do, how do I relate that back to our change in internal energy is equal to Q minus W? Well, what this means is the change in internal energy is equal to the heat added. W is zero, so whatever whatever energy is added to the system goes into increasing the thermal the internal energy of the gas particles, which basically means the gas particles are going to move faster, we're going to get a greater pressure, which is seen over here. The next process we're going to look at is an isothermal process. Now isothermal means constant temperature. We've looked at an uh, isotherm before, but now we're going to think about what this means in terms of the first law. So if we have an isothermal process, we have state 1 up here and state 2 down here, how do we get from state 1 to state 2? Well, it turns out both pressure and volume have to change. If we're going to move from state 1 to state 2, the volume is going to get bigger, or yeah, the volume is going to get bigger and the pressure is going to go down. What about the internal energy? Well, if internal energy is directly proportional to temperature, and for an ideal gas it is, um, then we know if the temperature change is equal to zero, that also means the change in internal energy is equal to zero. Therefore, we can rewrite this law, change in internal energy is equal to heat added minus work done, to be simply that the heat added is equal to the work done, and pressure and volume both change in order to keep this true. So our law reduces to this, in an isothermal process. Now the last process we're going to look at is an adiabatic process. And adiabatic means that it happens when no heat is transferred into or out of the system. This is tricky to do because there's no such thing as an actually uh, completely thermally insulated system where no heat gets into or out of it. But we're saying Q equals zero. So this is an ideal process. However, we can get fairly close to these if it happens rapidly so that there's not enough time for energy to transfer. So what happens in an, in an adiabatic process? Well again, let's draw a pressure versus volume PV graph. And I'm going to draw an isotherm over here. And I'm going to draw a second isotherm at a different temperature over here. Now how do I get from say, let's actually start this one up a little higher. How do I get from state 1 to state 2 where I have state 1 here and I have state 2 here? Well, in an adiabatic expansion, what happens is this point connects up like this. So you'll notice that this curve is actually a little bit steeper than an isothermal curve. Uh, and so we get a slightly different relationship. Now, uh, it is still true that the change in internal energy is equal to Q minus W, heat added minus work done, uh, but in this case we're saying no heat can be gained or lost, which means all of the internal energy, whatever that change is, that's equal to the work the system does. You'll notice in an adiabatic process, which goes from state 1 to state 2, all three variables of state change. Um, Pressure is not constant, volume is not constant, temperature is not constant. We move from one isotherm to another. Um, we're not on the same vertical line. We're not on the same horizontal line. So all three states change when we go through an adiabatic process. 